guys, welcome back to Natalie's Diary. Today we're reading like Yun Jin from the Seraphim. So at this point, I'm just choosing who I want to do, but I'm really into the Seraphim recently. I decided I want to make this video when Unforgiven came out, but that was a while back. I'm a procrastinator and I was like, oh, I'm going to order this stuff later, but I'm super glad I chose her because I've been super stressed recently and I feel like self-help books really help my mental health. It seems like Yeonjin is really good at this because all her books that she has recommended, I think I'll post the news article below, but none of it is like two or more like self-help type like psychology or like personal growth spirituality yeah but they're definitely not like oh like here's classic literature we're gonna read 1984 by george orwell yeah also i'm trying to say the word like less but i don't know if that's working so yeah let's get into the video okay so the first book is you are the universe and funny thing i'm telling you if you read in cafes or starbucks people come up to you and ask about books or what do you think of the book because this has happened like twice or three times to me i rarely bring books to starbucks because i'm usually doing schoolwork there and she was like what do you think of the book and i was like oh i just started i like it's definitely heavy on super sciencey terms i feel like but it's like, oh, quantum something something. An atom is this much. Newton's law of, or they're bringing up Albert Einstein and his his stuff. And I just, it's it's a lot more dense that I have to take time and process. I feel like for other self help books, it's one liners. I can underline it and go, yeah, I can do that. I can have a positive mindset for a day. You know, those like one liners you can just take and apply to your life. But I feel like this, you gotta constantly pay attention. But then again. I'm only 90 pages in so far, and there's like around two, 250, I'd say. So let's see if my thoughts should be. first book you are the universe now i was deeply confused reading this and at first i was like Ooh, like kind of like self-help you can manifest things into existence not what i thought i thought it was okay and would i read this again personally for me probably not but i think it's super heavy on like physics mixed with philosophy not necessarily self-help but the whole idea in this book is that the universe is alive it just felt like reading a giant physics textbook so it felt super dense and heavy there are i believe it follows like a bunch of questions but i was reading other reviews online and they agreed that it just felt like a bunch of physics knowledge thrown at you and and it's the idea that you have to kind of know a bunch of other knowledge before you read it like interconnected knowledge kind of got to understand because there's a bunch of questions surrounding how is the universe created and they ask nine questions here. it's not exactly like lore but you kind of got to know you know what kind of questions are people asking about the universe and here are the nine basic questions what came before the big bang why does the universe fit together so perfectly where did time come from what is the universe made of is there a design in the universe is the quantum world linked to everyday life do we live in a conscious universe how did life first begin does the brain create the mind but they do give good analogies to kind of break it down so they really go into quantum physics i'd say and i'm not sure how scientific it is or it's just linking an idea to a bunch of science so it's about how the universe is alive it's conscious and that idea has been debated for a while it goes into like a bunch of like bohr what bohr einstein like all the famous scientists Okay, so one review summarized it best on Goodreads. 
Their base argument can be hyperbolized and summarized as Einstein's theory of relativity suggests that our perception doesn't match reality. Therefore, everything is a matter of perception, which makes the universe and humanity basically the same. And their scientific ideas are kind of loosely connected to pseudo-philosophy, yeah, because they use the words consciousness and quantum to suggest some scientific backing. This is said by Jacob Mahaffey on Goodreads. And I so agree. I'm just confused. And maybe I just didn't get it. And maybe this might be your book, because some people do like it. One of the examples I really like to make their point about subatomic particles on chance and choice was that if you stand on top of a tall building and you're watching the traffic below and the street is split into two ways, right? Some are going, some cars are going left and some cars are going right. If you watch over a period of time, you could expect that roughly half the cars are going right and half the cars are going left. Now, would you know which cars, which exact cars are going left and which exact cars are going right before they actually make it? No, because it's a random act to you, given your perspective of standing on top of the roof. It's random, so you don't know. But there is actually no randomness if you taken perspective of the driver. The driver knows where they're going. Let's say grocery store is left, bank is right. This driver knows he wants to go to a grocery store on left, so he goes on the left. Driver knows that he needs to get to the bank on the right, so they go right, but that's not random. So their decision regarding which way they're turning has no correlation to chance, but by choice. And essentially they were saying it's the same thing about the behavior of sub atomic particles that science suggests yes that in laboratory settings particles do not act like inner agents but make unpredictable choices between alternative possibilities according to the laws of quantum mechanics and essentially that translates into the universe has a mind and the mind is everywhere agents make choices to what happens around us and it's not just the swirling of matter. So essentially like our universe is being, you know, constantly created and though it may not affect our choices, although we may not be controlled because we're in that laboratory setting that our choices are limited. I'm not sure. I'm just going to keep my mouth shut because I don't know that much about physics or science, but yeah, I'd give this a flat three. So the second book is The Power of Now. And I've definitely heard of both of these books, You Are the Universe and The Power of Now. They're quite popular. I haven't heard of the third one, but I'll get into that later. And yes, I take notes, but the purpose of taking notes, it looks like a fucking thesis and I get it. And if you want to annotate like a fucking thesis, you do you. I know some people hate that and they're like, what the fuck are you doing? Like this ain't school and they'd be hating on that. And, you know, everyone does things differently. So you do you. Personally, I don't. I don't ever annotate this much unless it's for a video because my short term memory loss from watching TikToks. Because I want to summarize for people who don't have the time to read it or don't really want to read it. I want to like summarize the point. So I have those tabbed. But yeah, I normally never, because it takes time and I feel like once for my own personal use, I'd rather just reread the entire thing. I'll underline a few lines here and there, but not like to this extent. But I don't know, some people like to do that and it's super cute, but just not for me. Also, these food fresh strawberries, delicious snacks. Let me get out my pen and annotation notes for this. This one's classified in the back as personal growth and spirituality. Also, I'm telling you, get your books off eBay or secondhand resellers because there's just something. Number one, it, there's kind of overconsumption in book talk, right? And I so understand that. But obviously, and I love going to the library, but obviously when I film videos, because my local library has the barcode at the front. And as humans, unfortunately, we like things that are aesthetically pleasing. So if I like get like a giant ass sticker and cover in the front, like I feel like 
you know, unfortunately not as many people want to look at that. But I'm telling you, secondhand resellers, it's a lot cheaper and there's just something about a worn-in book, you know, a worn-in book. The feeling of someone having already read this book or someone flipping, because you know when the new book, you kind of crease the cover and then it's like fucking like bouncing back up every two seconds. That annoys me because there's just one crease. So I try to be, obviously I'm not perfect, I shop on Amazon, I'm not claiming to be wow, like, like don't come for me, but I do shop on Amazon, but I also try to keep in mind sometimes because I feel like book talk always promotes overconsumption every fucking day, it's new Amazon haul, new, and I, and I get it, you know, always try to be conscious at least, and Okay, now, this book is super popular, The Power of Now, and I kind of get it, but I've been reading a lot of more of self-help books recently, so I feel like the ideas are kind of the same, but the way I digest self-help books are, I don't digest all of it, I kind of, this is, this may be a red flag, but I kind of digest what I want to digest, as in, I'll take like one-liners, like, oh, you gotta get up and wake up at early in the morning every day because this will change your life and then they'll talk about like a bunch of other religious stuff and I'll just ignore the religious stuff because but there is some they talk about God a lot in here but I kind of just didn't even listen to like I read it I comprehended it but I just didn't have an opinion on it but yeah so for those of you who don't want to read the book, let me summarize it for you because like I said, I took the notes. But one thing I really liked about this book was that they have this swirl symbol kind of to tell you, oh, take a moment and just digest what you read. And I really appreciate that because sometimes we read stuff and you comprehend it, but are you actually going to implement that? Like, no, you got to let it sink in. I kind of like that. Chapter one, you are not your mind. So they talk about a story of a beggar and a beggar is sitting on a box every day and they need money, right? They're always asking for money. Oh, I have no money. Stranger walks by and it's like, oh, I don't have anything to give to you, but maybe check under your box. And the beggar's like, but I have nothing. And then the beggar lifts up the box and realize there's gold under it. So essentially what the analogy is, is that the stranger didn't actually give the beggar anything. Everything, your riches, I guess we could say, is within you. And I guess that was the analogy they were going with. And I feel like opening with that was pretty good. Okay, and then they also quote Descartes, which is a philosopher, and he's famous for saying, I think, therefore I am. But you're mistaking being and identity with thinking. You're not your mind, because being, they capitalize being, like so it's like a noun. And they're saying that being can be felt, not mentally understood. They also say that thinking has become a disease and disease happens when things are out of balance or kind of get out of control. For example, overthinking and even if a voice in your head is relevant to the situation at hand, it will interpret it in terms of the past because the voice belongs to your mind. But their whole idea is that you want to live in the present, not the past. Listen to the voice in your head. Be there as the witnessing presence when you listen to that voice. Listen impartially, like consciously. I guess don't let the voice in your head kind of like overthink or over dictate your actions. I'm not saying that thinking is bad, but a lot of 
useless thinking in which present moment does not exist. You want to live in the present, but this overthinking is dictating. It never is living in the present. It's always thinking about the past actions or the future consequences type. Emotion is the body's reaction to your mind. The body will always give a truthful reflection. Thoughts will lie. One of the main tasks of the mind is to fight or remove that emotional pain, thus the reasons for its incessant activity. So that's why you're always overthinking. In fact, the harder the mind struggles to get rid of the pain, the greater the pain. You want to feel love, peace, joy, because emotions are short-term, while love, peace, joy are deep states of being. What's sometimes wrongly called joy is usually short-lived pleasure, side of the continuously alternating pain and pleasure cycle. This identification, pleasure comes from the outside while joy comes within. Consciousness, the way out of pain. So there are two types of pain, the pain you're creating now and the pain that still lives in your mind and body from the past. So to stop creating pain for yourself and others, stop creating time. Now, how do you stop creating time? You live in the moment because you're creating time by thinking about the past, thinking about the present. I don't know, this is very spiritual. Like as in the literal terms, it doesn't make sense. But if you get it, you get it. And for the past pain, your presence is enough. You cannot fight the darkness and trying to do so creates more inner conflict and pain. However, watching, it's enough watching. And by watching, you imply that you accept it. It's a part of that moment. Kind of like it helps you move on in the process. Like obviously, who wants to live through trauma? Like you don't want that. But what's happened is what's happened, so. Watch out for defensiveness within yourself. What are you defending? Your, this is so funny, it's me touching grass. Your illusory identity, the image in your head, a fictitious entity, ego and fear, to be wrong is to die. Then chapter three, moving deeply into the now. All problems are illusions of the mind. This isn't about solving your problems. It's about realizing that there are no problems only situations to be dealt with or left alone. Chapter four, mind strategies for avoiding the now. To complain is to make yourself the victim, non-acceptance. Either take charge or take action, speak out or leave the situation or accept it. So those are your choices. Any action is better than no action or else you might be stuck forever. Stress is caused by being here, but wanting to be there. Stop being a waiter, waiting in line at the post office, traffic jam, airport, waiting for someone to arrive, waiting for the next vacation, waiting for a better job. I just realized how much I was waiting, you know, waiting for this, waiting for that. So I went to go see Oppenheimer recently, right? And my friend, one of my friends is a homebody. They don't like to go out and I like to be alone, but I like to go out, if that makes sense. And yeah, I love hanging out with my close friends, so I was like, hey, do you want to go see Oppenheimer? And she was like, oh, not really. Like, she wants to see it, just not now. And I was like, well, I don't have time next week, and it's going to leave soon. So I was just like, fuck it, I'll go by myself. At first, I was scared to kind of go out alone, go to cafes alone. But I really found comfort in that, because obviously, if you want to go out with someone, you have to wait until they they want to go out or they're available and obviously that's not as hard if your friends like going out but my friends don't like going out oh when can we go to this cafe when can i go to the movies with you and it's just always waiting 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 i was just like fuck it and then chapter five the state of presence close your eyes and say i wonder what my next thought is then become alert and wait for your next thought chances are you had to wait a while because you're in a state of intense presence silence create presence and i read a while back, the quieter you become, the more you'll be able to hear. And it's not like, oh, shut your mouth up. It's more like, listen, look at your surroundings, be aware. Chapter six, the inner body. Forgiveness is to offer no resistance to life, to allow life to live through you. Chapter eight, enlightened relationships. You are yourself. You do not judge yourself, feel sorry for yourself. You are not proud of yourself. You do not love yourself. You do not hate yourself because you are yourself. There are no longer no relationships with yourself. So in order to hate yourself, you're kind of like, here's you and here's yourself. I hate. 
but if you are you you can't kind of like I don't know don't take this like it's not a literal sense again if you get it you get it chapter 9 beyond happiness and unhappiness there is peace happiness depends on conditions being perceived as positive inner peace does not forgiveness of the presence is even more important than forgiveness of the past if you forgive every moment you allow it to be as it is then there will be no accumulation of resentment that needs to be forgiven at some time later I feel like there were some good one-liners here. You know what I mean? 3, 3.5 maybe? But again, like, don't take people's reviews of books as good or bad because a book I may not like may be something you like. I introduced the last book, The Artist's Journey from Making Art and Being an Artist. Okay, so I just finished the artist's journey on making art and being an artist. And I think I thought this one for me was pretty good. And maybe it's because I don't have all my friends are going into STEM. I feel like there's certain beauty about going into something that's more or like the liberal arts, something non-STEM related. You know what I mean? Because STEM is obviously considered money making or whatever, and a lot of parents, you know, discourage their children from pursuing the arts, something they may be passionate about because it may not feed the family. But I ha recently met a new friend who wants to pursue writing, and as a book lover, I was like, send me your book, girl, when you publish, because I'd be so, like, I will buy it, okay? But I low-key want to gift this to her because I get why Yeonjin read it because, you know, not everything is easy but I feel like for this, the author, and obviously I'm coming in from a STEM perspective so let me know if this is, this advice in here is not practical or whatever or it's actually shit because I'm coming in from a STEM perspective obviously it's not as I'm not planning to be an artist or a writer so this advice may not be applicable but I thought it was pretty good advice that I would want to share with my friend who wants to be a writer so it essentially is called the artist journey and it kind of details you know different challenges you may face and except I don't know how to explain it and I feel like the last words I say the better but so essentially it starts with chapter one, which is courting the muse, finding the place where time stands still. And essentially he's saying that for art, he's kind of introing, he's like, for me, for art, there's this, you know, he went to Stanford and I took all these classes, but the one class where time did not exist was, I believe, sculpting or like art class. He was like, I didn't realize it was 5 a.m. in the morning. And then... I was like, wow, I found my passion. And then chapter two was about finding a vision and finding a voice, the search for an authentic personal expression. And essentially he was always saying like how artists are always looking for greatness, you know. As a spectator, we always, someone who likes to look at art, we always call things, oh, this, this person's work is great. You know, this is greatness type. And he's saying that greatness is an idea, a status conferred by others. And he's just saying that greatness is conferred by others. Like stop trying to achieve greatness because it's determined by others and it's not something. You know, it's like an opinion. We are often the worst judges of our own work. We are too close to it and too invested in it to see its strength and weaknesses. He was explaining how you want excellence to be a habit, a uh, a standard or expectation of an artist's creation because excellence cannot be quantified and it is diff 
different for each person. It is where your character shines through your creation. It is your commitment frozen in time and space. It is your spiritual signature on your work. And it's the idea that excellence is the best you can give at that time. This also explaining the, the more financial situations of art and being an artist. If your art cannot support your life, your life must support your art. Explaining how T.S. Eliot was a banker, Charles Ivan Wallace Stevens were insurance executives, Philip Glass was a plumber, Kurt Vonnegut sold cars. And the last quote I have is, and then he goes into artists' success, you know. But he was saying how success can sometimes be shackles because an artist's success creates expectations. And once you get expectations, the audience is essentially defining the path you're supposed to, to walk. Let's say you create a piece that gets garners a lot of attention, goes out for a lot of money, you earn a lot. But then the audience is expecting more of that from you and essentially you're shackled to that path because you have to recreate that success. But the reason why I really liked this one for me was because it went through a lot of, you know, the journey of exploring your niche and your love for art and then starting out. And then once you find success, this will happen. But you don't want to, I feel like it really did explain the artist's journey. So hopefully I will never have to film at, now it's 2 a.m. My top picks. I, I genuinely, after reading this book, especially this one, I respect Yeonjun, you know? You can see the passion in her work, and I admire that. But my favorite was the art story. I'm low-key gonna get another copy for my friend who wants to be a writer. But I wanna, like, I don't wanna overhype things, you know what I mean? Because then people have expectations, and I'm not overhyping, like, wow, you have to fucking read this. I think it was pretty good. And it's just because I have a friend who wants to be a writer, and it's just conveniently I read this book. Because I feel like I don't read that many books like this one. I'm glad I had the chance to read this. And then The Power of Now, and then You Are the Universe. But yeah. Thanks for watching and sorry for the shitty lighting.